Hey there, and welcome to the Apartment Building Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Micah Blanc. Today on the show, I have Patrick Donahoe, and I've been waiting to have him on the show for a while. He really has a very interesting concept that teaches you how to be your own bank. In other words, you have less reliance on the markets, on the banking system, and he teaches you how to put this together using life insurance policies. Fascinating stuff. It's been around for literally like hundreds of years. Um, rich people use it. You know, uh, on the real estate guys cruise, I had Robert Kiyosaki, Ken McElroy, all these guys are like, oh yeah, I've been doing this for years. So every time I see rich people do something, you know, I, I kind of I, I kind of watch them. And, and my lesson so far in life is you don't have to be rich to learn from the rich. And this is another example of that. So he's got, uh, he's got a, a book out called uh, Heads I Win, Tales You Lose. And I wanted him to, to come on the show today, talk about how, to, how he builds up this banking system because the benefits are extraordinary uh, to the point where you can use it to finance uh, car purchases, even your house purchases. And then within years, it becomes a, a retirement fund that pays you kind of like a like an IRA might. And then after that, it actually has a death benefit. So and then fourth, it's actually a legacy you can pay it, pass on to your children that keeps paying and paying and paying. And it is absolutely fantastic. So I'm really, really interested in that. So we're going to get into that in just a second. Before we do, I just want to make, remind you guys, my book is out, Financial Freedom with Real Estate Investing. It took me a long time to, uh, to write this book. It's all about, well, how you, can come, how you can quit your job with real estate, even if you don't have the experience or your own cash. And of course, uh, a spoiler alert, it's about apartment building investing. Um, but I go step by step through how you can get started without experience or without any cash. All right, so appreciate that. Let's get right in the interview with Patrick Donahoe. Here we go. Patrick, welcome to the show today. How are you doing, Michael? It's, uh, it's good, uh, good to be on. Yeah, man, it's great that you're on here. Um, we've known each other for uh, about, about a year and a half now. We met a couple of times, and I'm just really fascinated by what you do. It was mm -hmm. always a bit of mystery to me, and I started looking into it. I read your, your, your uh, book, Head, you know, Heads, I, Heads I Win, Tails You Lose, or the other way around. <laughs> And fascinating. Oh, you, right. you got it right. So, mm -hmm. so, so, I, you know, I, I wanted you on the show because the stuff that you're teaching is so new to me. And I, you know, I, I heard about it first time on the real estate guys cruise and, you know, it's got Robert Kiyosaki, Ken McElroy on there and you know, people going, you know, <clears throat> uh, Phil, what are you doing? All right, hold on. We have to start that one over. I'm going to lock, I'm going to lock this meeting. Who, who is that? <laughs> one of my, uh, more. We're going to start that one out. Luckily, we're only 60 seconds into it, and I screwed up the title of your book, so we got to fix that. No, you got that. I think uh, you got it right. Has everyone tells you lose? Locking meeting so no one else can join. This happens sometimes because the link just floats around on there. Do you just use the same link then for each for each meeting? I do. Has everyone yeah, tells you. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. All right, here we go. Take two. Okay. Three, two, one. Patrick, welcome to the show today. How you doing, Michael? It's, uh, it's awesome to be on. It's great to have you finally on the show. We've known each other for, for a while, and I first met you a couple of years on the Real Estate Guys Cruise, and you teach something that was really mysterious to me, and I started looking into it over the last few months, saw you again uh, this past spring, really looking into the, uh, the alternative to a banking system that, that you teach and that you have a book out called Heads I Win, Tails, I, Tails You Lose, where you talk about uh, how this is together, and I think this thing is fascinating. Every time I hear someone you know, come up with these new ideas, especially when other people like Robert Kiyosaki, Ken McElroy, they're like, oh yeah, we know about that. We do that all the time. I'm like, well, where has this been all my life, right? Mm -hmm. So every time I learn something like that, I'm fascinated by it. So I'm, I'm really pleased that you're here because you've really literally written a book on it. And as it turns out, it's been around, or a variation of that has been around for a very long time, but it's a very, very little understood thing. So we'll keep it at thing for now. Before we get into the thing, um, just a little, introduce yourself a little bit and talk about your business. Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I uh, you know, I've been, I've been doing this for over, uh, over a decade. I actually learned about the strat financial strategies we teach from one of the first rich dad advisors. Her name's uh, Kim Butler. So I met her through this executive entrepreneur coaching program, like back in 2006, 2005, 2006. And it fascinated me as far as what she, what she did. And similar to your story, uh, I, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. It totally shifted my mindset regarding just business and my career and my future. And, and so meeting her, I also had that, you know, kind of starstruckness where, you know, I, I was glued to her every word. Uh, but she, you know, took me in a sense under under her wing, taught me 
uh, you know, a, a lot about what she did. And uh, in the in the the financial strategies are are as you said, really they've been around for a long a long time, a really long time. And it was what we call the the traditional financial planning, uh, but the typical financial planning took over in the 1970s and 1980s, right? With the advent of some legislation as well as you know some failure in pension plans. So it, it's it really has been drowned out by a lot of the noise that's been created by. Uh, the typical financial planning world. So your investment banks, your mutual funds, and, and so forth. And uh, so, you know, my story is 2007 is when I decided to uh, actually do it full time. And I, I formed a partnership with the company I was working with. And it, and it was going great for, for six months-ish. Uh, and then, you know, the whole 2008, 2009 calamities, you know, financial calamities, you know, wiped, wiped uh, the partnership out. And, and I was, you know, on the brink of, well, my wife wanted me to just go get a job anywhere because nothing was coming in and a lot was going out. Uh, but anyway, I, I, you know, I stuck it out and through, you know, some partnerships and through some, you know, I would say st uh, serendipity, you know, I, I was able to, uh, to make it right. So we've been around, we have, you know, clients in all States, uh, the various provinces in Canada, uh, some international clients as well. And, you know, we, we, teach, we teach this strategy and how it pertains to uh, a person's financial life, right? You're, you're used to, to talking with real estate investors. Uh, that, it, you know, tends to be a big part of our audience. Uh, but as far as business owners or just regular people, you know, it works, uh, it works as well. And it is, it's something that, you know, is kind of making its way back into, you know, the mainstream, I guess you can say, because, you know, there has been such a, uh, you know, dissatisfaction with, Wall Street and 401ks and IRAs and mutual funds. And, uh, and I think, you know, with market corrections on the horizon, I think it's going to, uh, uh, you know, weather, up, weather that storm, obviously, but become more, uh, more popular uh, as people start to realize, you know, a lot of the stuff that goes on on the East Coast and in those markets and, uh, and why it doesn't necessarily benefit them in the short or the long run. And before we get into the solution, let's talk about the problem because your, your title of your book is very interesting. It says, Heads I Win, Tails You Lose, which is interesting as well. But it's a financial strategy to reignite the American dream, implying that there's something wrong with the American dream. What's wrong, in your opinion, about the American dream? There's many, there's many things. I, I would say in the, in the book, I really tried to emphasize what the dream was initially and what it's become. And so initially it was independence and freedom. And today it's no longer that. It's essentially being taken care of uh, and not doing, which is kind of the definition of retirement. And, and so people are essentially working in something that has this conclusion of not doing or not contributing anymore uh, at, at a certain age. And the, the, the inherent flaws behind it uh, are, are everywhere. The, sign, the signs are, are everywhere. And it comes to, you know, just the lack of savings people has or have. It comes to, you know, the issues with Social Security. It comes to, you know, a lot of the, the pension issues that exist with municipalities. You know, the, the idea behind retirement, I think, has uh, been this, it was this poster child, right, of, of uh, financial services. And it's been kind of seared into people's mind as far as what they should achieve. But the original American dream was to obtain freedom, right, and to be independent. So that's the theme of the book: is really breaking down and defining what is freedom, you know, financial freedom, which is a theme of your book as well. And it's a combination of a few things. You know, first and foremost, it's you know realizing that retirement is not possible uh, unless you want to save fifty to sixty percent of your income right now, which nobody does. Uh, just because of longevity, because of rates of return, because of you know the typical investments that are out there, and the book essentially breaks down all of that math and shows that it's very unreasonable to uh, to believe that. Uh, but then second, it's also you know what you do with uh, with your money. Most people are taught that wealth is built outside of them, and I don't believe that's the case. Now, obviously, you advocate real estate. I advocate uh, some financial tools and products as well, including real estate. At the same time, the greatest wealth is is built within a person, right? And it's what they uh, discover in themselves it's the most valuable to other people and that is also something I tried to break out in the book is how you go about discovering that process because you know I know a lot of people that you know on, on a financial statement are financially free okay but in their life they're they're as broke as broke as they were with no money 
And, it, and the idea is it's really using the tool of financial freedom to discover something that you could do that's most meaningful to you, which ultimately is going to be most meaningful to others. And in the process of doing that, the, the money that comes in is, uh, you know, is, is, is incredible. And I, I consider that the definition of, of freedom. And it is, it's a perspective, you know, that is completely different than what people consider as the American dream today. So it's a, it's a difficult pill to swallow. But at the same time, you know, there's, there's a lot of hope out there and our society is providing so much opportunity to, you know, to discover who you are and find meaningful work, a meaningful career. Uh, and, uh, and I've seen it uh, numerous, numerous times. And uh, so that's really kind of the part of the, the mindset that we try to open up and allow people to, uh, to, to see. And, I, and you know, it's been, the book took me a really long time. I, you know, I commend you for writing your book. It's a, it's a lengthy process of how to you know, try to convey that message, but I think the book does a decent job of it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good things you write in the book about uh, you are your number one asset to make sure you're investing your asset. And a lot of the mindset you put in there, um, I could think of, we could fill another ep podcast episode on that because it was really, really valuable. Um, I want to talk about kind of the banking system that you create because that's what I, you know, that's I think what's really interesting to, and surprising to a lot of listeners. And your argument is that, you know, savings is basically dead, right? You can't save yourself the retirement. And that's why a lot of my listeners and yours listeners thinking, well, what else can I do? I can do real estate investing and I can try to get there, accelerate that process. And your argument is, yes, you can, but there's also another way. And, and I think one of the things you argue is that we kind of take banking or financing or credit as kind of we kind of use that without thinking too much about it. And you're arguing in your book that, hey, you know what, we have an opportunity to create our own banking system. Uh, how do we do that? And if we do that, uh, do, we, do we need banks ever again? And your argument is actually no. And, and, and when, if we do that over a period of years, uh, not only can I use that to finance all of my purchases, uh, including cars and, and houses, uh, but gosh, uh, it becomes in a retirement vehicle. And then, and it actually has a death benefit at the end of it. So as you just go, I want you to kind of go, go, go describe this vehicle that you that, that you talk about in this book and talk about some of the benefits and then I'd like to maybe get in some of the mechanics um, obviously the details are going to be in your in your book uh, if you want to find out about that but I think it's just really really fascinating so can you talk about kind of the benefits of that and obviously a lot of these benefits you don't get in any other way savings or going to banks or, or and 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 so talk about some of the, the benefits or just an overview I think you call it the perpetual wealth strategy. I really, I really love that because not only does it solve your immediate problems of financing things, but if you set it up right, it literally can take, take care of, of generations of all your children, your children, your children, and literally leave a financial legacy. And so, man, it's good stuff. So let's get started at the top here. Kind of give us an overview of the perpetual wealth strategy, Patrick. No, it's a great intro to it. And I would, I would say, you know, tools are only as valuable as the, the person that's using them. And, you know, I, I've seen and experienced a lot of people obtain a tremendous amount of success with, with real estate, with business, even the stock market, right? I've seen a ton of success there. Uh, and insurance, even, even some of the, uh, the, the financial tools that, that we advocate and teach about, I've seen a lot of people fail using them. So the tool is one part of the equation, right? It's the, it's the use of it that, uh, that's the others, which is what's in our control. And, and, I, and I look at really tools are typically uh, being blamed for a lot of things these days instead of a person taking or a, a human being or a group of human beings, you know, taking responsibility for the use of those uh, specific tools. Anyway, that's another, another topic. But the idea, you know, the, the strategy that we, that we advocate is, is the foundation. It's not the end all be all. It's not going to make all your dreams come true. But it's the foundation because it does it does multiple things. And what I what I try to break out in the book is is how how it operates the the type of gain you get from it from one aspect and another aspect. Uh, but it it is it's one of those it's one of those things where it's still hard it's still hard to believe just how little return people get in mutual funds in their qualified plan uh, and for a variety of different factors and how well this asset performs. And so the, the foundation of the perpetual wealth strategy is a, a specifically, uh, designed whole life insurance policy with a mutual company. And it's designed for, uh, cash value accumulation, typically not for older individuals. I, you know, we might be able to get into that, uh, because it plays different roles as you get later, you know, as you're you know, later, later in life. But the idea is to, this is you know, put your savings in here. You accumulate your your savings, what you're earning, uh, and then there is a provision with this type of account where they get, the insurance company gives you a line of credit against it. 
And so as you're accumulating money, it's growing uh, without any taxes incurred. It's, it's private. It's not susceptible to creditors. Okay. And as you said, it also comes with a, a coverage, which, you know, that's not the primary purpose in the beginning, uh, but nonetheless, it still provides a, a permanent, permanent coverage amount. But the idea is that you're accumulating money, okay? It's earning interest. It's earning interest with a lot of tax benefit, but then you're also able to access it uh, through the insurance company giving you a loan. And that loan is from their other monies. And so basically it gives you kind of double the economic power uh, to do what you want. And it could be to you know, put money into a real estate deal. It could put, be putting money into a business uh, and a uh, variety of other things. And I give some examples in, in the book of that, actual examples. Uh, but the idea is it essentially takes money away from going into an investment bank or going into a normal bank where you don't have those same characteristics. You have an investment if it goes into a mutual fund or a 401k, and also if it goes into a bank, it's, it's savings because you can't necessarily lose the money, but you don't earn anything on it. Plus, if you want to get a line of credit or have leverage against it, that's not available unless you go through and jump through a, a bunch of other hoops. So the idea is this is a foundational vehicle, especially for real estate investors, where uh, you, you keep your liquid wealth. Uh, whether it's your reserve or your opportunity fund. And then when you, when you are presented with an opportunity, instead of having to liquidate the account, you can now borrow against it from the insurance company to facilitate the deal. And, and then as the deal pays interest, uh, as it pays cash flow, then you're able to replenish your savings by essentially paying down uh, the loan that they've given you. So that's the idea behind the, the foundation. Uh, and, and then as time, time goes on, as you had mentioned, it plays some additional roles. Uh, there is interest, there's dividends, which can be accessed tax-free. So it could be part of your passive income in the future. But a big piece, and especially with real estate investors, I mean, I have a client right now who has uh, $7 million worth of paid off real estate. And that's just the, that's just the and he has $4 million in cash. And he's like, you know, and he's preparing with his estate and he's preparing for you know, his kid's future, his legacy. And, and fortunately, he has a lot of insurance uh, on him. And so we're looking at essentially designing his estate plan, his leg legacy plan, so that it mitigates a lot of the taxes associated with transferring real estate. Okay? Also, uh, there's, he has some business interests as well. So the idea of insurance is that it's the most liquid legacy asset available. Real estate isn't liquid when it passes uh, in your estate. Uh, you know, business assets, same thing. So if you really look at the benefit in the future, it also, you know, enables a family to pass on that legacy, a liquid legacy, which facilitates, you know, the, the use of, of real estate going into perpetuity, right? Because if there wasn't any liquidity that passes to the estate, what are they going to do with the real estate, right? They're probably going to sell it if the kids need some liquid assets, right? So it's one of those, I don't know, it's one of those things where it plays a huge role when it comes to legacy planning. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Now, is this is this for for I mean, is this for everybody? Uh, do you have to be very wealthy for this stuff? In other words, uh, who is this for? It's a good question. It, it I think the wealthy understand it because they know how to use it, and it, and they know how to use it because that's what they're used to. They're used to being in control of their of their finances. Uh, individuals that are used to having someone else control their financial destiny for them. That's where it's a little bit more difficult because this is essentially taking back, right, control of your wealth, of your money, uh, and in a sense, uh, you're gonna have gain, you're gonna have interest. But as I mentioned before, you know, there's no financial vehicle that's out there that's gonna provide financial freedom for you, in my, in my opinion. Uh, it, it could provide you more cash flow than your expenses, but I believe that true freedom is defined differently. So the idea is that the mindset required takes precedent to the success of this strategy, and I would argue any other strategy. So that's where we try to, you know, we, we've taught, you know, college grads that are right out of college, has a have a bunch of student loan debt. They've been able to optimize it by uh, using this to pay off their student loan debt or take advantage of uh, different business opportunities or investment. But we've also had, you know, college grads that have not been successful with it. So it really, it, it, there's no, uh, there's no like uh, barrier to entry as far as the money you have is concerned. It's more of the barrier to entry is, is more of a mindset.
Huh, as it always is. That's amazing, right? So you can get started very small with this stuff. Uh, but again, it's, it's definitely a mindset shift. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. So you talked about an interest that you get from this, uh, from this life insurance company. And it's a little, where's that, in, how much interest are we, are we getting? And where does that interest come from? Like, why, why would uh, why that interest be higher than say, you know, a bank CD, for example? So what is the interest that you're typically getting here? And, and where's that even come from? No, it's actually, that's actually a really good question. So First, I would say you have to define what a, what a mutual company is. So a mutual company has no, uh, has no owners other than specific account holders, which is this type of uh, account or, or policy. Uh, a a stock-based insurance company like uh, you know, a MetLife or an AIG, these are companies that are, you can go on you know, your, your brokerage account and, and purchase stock in. Okay, so you have to distinguish the difference between the two type of companies. Mutual companies you actually uh, own and receive a profit share okay, of, uh, of their overall profits. This is where it gets into some of the complexities, right? Because when you put money you know, into a, a policy, it's the same as, in a sense, putting money into a bank, right? You don't have this box in the back of the vault that has your name on it that says, this is Michael's bank account. It has all your money in there, right? It goes into a big pool of money, of everybody else's money. And they specifically have on their financial statement, right, a, a line item that says, we owe Michael this much money, right? So very similar. So if you put money into an insurance company, okay, they essentially take that money and they invest it. And they're, uh, you know, you, you can call them institutional investors. Uh, they have 150, 200 years of investment performance. Uh, one of the ones we use, I was actually there last week, and uh, they had zero defaults on any of their investments you know, during 2008, 2009, uh, but they also have what's called underwriting profits. And so insurance companies don't just uh, provide life insurance, they provide disability insurance, long-term care insurance, annuities, uh, and the list goes on. And so when you look at the profit of an insurance company, it's one based on their investment performance, but it's also based on their profitability with selling insurance. And typically insurance, they have models or science behind it that tells them, here's how many people are going to be disabled and this is what you should charge and this is the profit you're going to get. That's all, that's all, in, all insurance, long-term care insurance, life insurance, et cetera. So you receive both you know, interest gain based on what their investments are uh, and you also receive interest gain based on what their, you know, what their underwriting and in insurance profits are. Right, so you're actually profiting from their profits, and and these days, uh, you know, how much interest or dividends can the normal policyholder expect each year? It, yeah, it depends per company. I mean, there's there's one right now, you know, specific to real estate that uh, that's been doing um, really well. I mean, they're all usually between four and six percent. They've been as high as nine if you go back to the '80s and '90s. Uh, but they, this specific company, uh, made this huge, like, hundred and seventy million dollar investment in the Boston Harbor. And this was back, I think, after the dot-com crash. And uh, they sold one of the parcels, I think two years ago, for like $1.4 billion or something like that. So it's, it's one of those things where, you know, they have access to a lot, a lot of capital, very well capitalized companies. And they're able to participate, whether in acquiring companies, uh, they're able to participate in, you know, those type of joint venture real estate developments, uh, business ventures, and, and so forth. So it's one of those it's one of those things where, you know, they, they have access to that, that money. Uh, they're institutional investor, investors. They, they have fiduciary responsibilities uh, to you as an, uh, an owner of, uh, of the company. Okay? But at the same time, you know, that's not 100% of their, you know, assets. Okay? That might be 5% or 10% for those, you know, maybe riskier ventures. Uh, but their whole purpose is, is long-term to be able to fulfill you know, essentially the benefits that they've guaranteed. I mean, a lot of this stuff is guaranteed. So therefore they're not, you know, putting money into, you know, cryptocurrency ICOs and, you know, they are the most conservative uh, investors that are, that are out there. And so their returns reflect, reflect that. But if you look at a four to 6% internal return after fees, right, tax-free compared to most mutual funds that are out there, it blows it out of the water. So it's it really one of those does. things where you do a comparison. Number one, this isn't an investment. Okay, it's more like savings, uh, and it gives you a, a really conservative return over, over time. However, the line of credit, right, the credit that they give you, the loan they give you against this account, that's where the power is. That's where you have control to use it, whether it's to invest in yourself, 
whether it's to invest in a business, whether it's to capitalize your business, put into a real estate deal, uh, et cetera. Well, there's actually two differences already from a savings account. Number one, the returns are much higher. I can't believe 5%. I was thinking in my head like 2%. You know, 5% is actually a lot. And you're right. The life insurance companies are the most conservative ones. They buy triple net properties and, and it's like the, the brain dead, low return, you know, thing. So 5%, that's a lot. And, and then you can then borrow um, against the value of that. And, and so you're, meanwhile, while you're borrowing and doing stuff with it, financing stuff, buying real estate, the full face value of that insurance policy is, is earning 5%. So you're kind of sort of double dipping in, in, in some sense. Now, how much of that can you borrow? So let's say I've got $100,000 I paid into a insurance policy. How much of that, you know, what's the cash value that I can borrow against? Well, it comes down to the, the, the design. There are a number of ways to, uh, to design it. But if you have $100,000 of, of cash that's there, okay, in, it's, it's earning its interest, it's earning its dividend. You can borrow up to the uh, entire amount. Oh. And you got to realize, though, that you are paying the insurance company interest. Okay, because you got to realize when an insurance company lends you money, it's not your money. Your money is part of the pool, but the line item, right, that's, that's there on their financial statement stays intact. Okay, this is essentially lending you money that would have gone to another investment, but because they lent it to you, okay, it can't go to another investment. So that's why they're going to charge you uh, pretty much what they would have earned somewhere else. Right now, you see loan rates from four to uh, four to five percent. Right, that's that's still pretty amazing because meanwhile you're 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 basically covering your costs by them paying you interest and dividends in the back end. So it's almost like you're not paying anything. And then there's the tax. At the same benefit. time, that loan, it's yeah. like you don't have to qualify for it. Right? right. There, it doesn't show up on your credit report. Uh, and they also only bill you interest once a year, and they allow you to defer. If there's enough cash value, they allow you to defer the interest to the next year hmm. without penalty. And so it's one of those loans that doesn't really. It doesn't make sense because there's nothing like it in the marketplace. Okay. But at the same time, if you look at the benefits of having that much flexibility, I mean, that's a, that's another kind of non tangible benefit on top of everything else. So like you said, it, it's not really an investment vehicle per se. It's, it's kind of a, like a, I, mean, I would call me a financial foundation, a, a, a utility, a tool that you can use. Can you give us an example of how one might use this? You know, pick something. I don't know. I want to finance a car, a house. I want to, I, whatever, you know, whatever people use it for. Once it's set up, kind of walk us through how it's used maybe over the years, maybe in the next five years and maybe next 20 years and what it becomes after that. And just give people a kind of a, an, an, a, a visual of what that could look like. Well, I'll, I'll explain how I, I use it, which is how we, how we teach uh, clients. And obviously, we, we teach clients relative to their situation. And so, all situations don't apply equally. And so, there's not one standard way of using it. So, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you my example. Uh, so, with, with me, how I've structured my entire financial life is uh, I hold my reserves inside of, uh, inside of insurance policies. That's both with uh, my personal life as well as my business. Um, and I have a, you know, I have 60 people that, that work underneath our umbrella and have a huge payroll. And, it, you know, it's something that, you know, I experienced not having money during 2008, 2009, 2010, right? And actually having negative money, figuring out, you know, how to, to uh, you know, to pay this bill and pay this employee. And it was, it was man, it was, uh, it was insane. It was similar to your franchise, franchise experience, I imagine. And the, the idea is now this helps my wife sleep, sleep well at night, right? Is knowing that there is a reserve there uh, for our personal lives. Uh, and I keep 12 months. I keep 12 months of our expenses in, inside of uh, various insurance policies. Uh, and then I keep uh, three months inside of uh, policies for my business. Then everything above and beyond that becomes my opportunity fund. So let's say you know, just round numbers, all of that was, you know, it's, it's more hundred thousand dollars. There's more than that, but it's hundred thousand dollars. So if I have $200,000 in my, you know, in policies, that second, you know, hundred thousand, the, the excess is what's my opportunity fund is. So my opportunity fund is I'm looking for opportunities to grow wealth. It could be invest in a, a, an employee, which I've done a lot of that in the past, uh, invest in a, a marketing platform, uh, invest in a property or invest in real estate, uh, invest in yourself, go to, you know, go to a seminar. And the idea is that, you know, you treat that access to capital, right, as an investment. 
Uh, and then that investment essentially is paid back as you get a return on that investment. Okay. So that's how I, that's how I operate. That's how I operate mine. And well, I have, a, let me get this straight there. You're using ahead. it for various different business expenses, including education and mm -hmm. uh, software and whatever else. And then, so you borrow against that and you pay a certain interest rate that you, uh, that you set possibly back to the, to the fund. And then you get to keep the profit of that investment or do you have to pay like an IRA? Do you have to pay the profit back into the, into the actual fund? No, it's not, it's not treated like an, an IRA. This is very, this is a use of it that is not dictated by anyone but you. Mm. It's not this like, you know, if fund administrator or, you know, the, an, an IRA or, or 401k administrator saying, here are the rules, you have to abide by the rules. Essentially, you, you create the rules. And with the flexibility of the loan, it could get very dicey, right? Because you know, if you don't have any rules, it's not going to benefit you. So how I, how I do it uh, is, you know, I essentially pay back a certain amount of profits uh, given the actual return that I want from what I'm using it for. So let's say it's an employee and I need to, to front, uh, you know, $50,000 to a recruiter and, and then their first two, three months as they're onboarding. I'm going to want, you know, a 2x return on that. And so I'll look at, okay, I need all my interest back plus a 2x return on that in initial investment. So I'll do something like that. For, but I, for like a menial, like let's say it's a car purchase or a remodel of your house. I don't really advocate stuff like that, but let's say it's a, a remodel of your house. And it, you know, the bank quoted you 8% and you had to pay it back on an amortization schedule of 10 years. So essentially you would borrow against uh, the policy uh, at let's say five, uh, and then you'd pay it back at 10 and that difference right, is essentially um, just, or not, uh, did I say eight in the beginning? You pay it back at eight, right? So you would, you know, essentially have uh, more money being paid back than it actually costs you to borrow. Now, you don't have to do that. I know people that don't pay, they just pay the interest that the insurance company charges them, which is fine. Uh, but there's others that, you know, would want to treat that capital the same as if they were, uh, you know, having to borrow from uh, a bank and what their rate would be. Isn't the idea to basically start replacing a bank through these kind of policies, right? So if you have the discipline, I talked about, you know, you have this tool and you can either use it this way or that way, mm -hmm. but it strikes me as if you, if you had the discipline to basically treat your own policy as if you're borrowing money for the bank, let's say you're, uh, you're, you're borrowing money to, to finance a car, you got to pay whatever 5% interest and certain amount of closing fees and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you, you treat, instead of going to the bank, you actually use your own policy for that. And, and let's say you pay back four or five years. You keep doing that. The cash value uh, keeps growing uh, as well as the interest and dividends that come from that. Yeah. And that's where, you know, with, with me, it's, I, I use it based on what I experienced in the, in the past. I experienced banks laughing at me when I wanted to get a credit, you know, I just wanted a, a card to give to employees right? So that they can, you know, have a card to make expenses instead of using just one card for everybody, right? And I couldn't get credit. I couldn't, and then this was, you know, 2009, 2010, 2011. And so I, I valued credit a lot more than, I valued my policies a lot more because that's all that I used uh, back then to finance the business. But as I've gotten, you know, my, my credit is, is excellent now, like all the blemishes are gone. And, and I use bank credit. I use it for, for real estate. I use it for business. But when I go into use credit, I have, an, I have an alternative. And because I have an alternative, I don't have to use them. And so if the terms are changed or the terms are not favorable or there's not enough flexibility or it's limited by the dollar amount, I don't have to, to dink around with them. Okay? I'm, I'm able to use you know, what I've already set up as, as, a tool, as a tool of leverage. And I think if you have alternatives, you're going to make better, better decisions when it comes to using bank money. Cause that's where I think a lot of people get, get in trouble when banks lend them a lot of, a lot of money. Most people don't realize that if things go sour, their life is, is not over, but their financial life is over, whether it's garnishments or court or fees or collections or credit. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where if you haven't experienced that, you know, go find someone that has, and, and hopefully that teaches you some good lessons in regards to using uh, using banks for whether it's your business or your, your real estate uh, or other purposes. I remember in, in the book, you also talk about that the, uh, the policy uh, takes on, uh, a, has a secondary benefit, the death benefit being one of them, but even before then, it becomes a passive income generator. 
where um, after a certain number of years, unlike an IRA that you draw on a certain amount, it starts uh, eating at the, at the principle of that. And as people live longer and longer, they actually, uh, most people run out, run out of money. After a certain number of years of using this policy in, in the way we described, um, it starts paying out a, an annual, I would say, dividend without actually diminishing the principle in perpetuity. At, mm-hmm. at what point does that happen? Like how many years would you have to you know, pay into this thing? And, and why is that even, how is that even possible? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want to get into too many, too many details. Uh, so I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. The, the policy is, is a foundational piece both in growing wealth and in distribu- distributing it at, at later points, whether it's for uh, passive income purposes uh, or whether it's bequeathing wealth to your, your next, next generation, right? So as you, as you get into how something, how something is possible, I mean, I, I would just say simply that these are, these are vehicles where the longer you pay in, okay, the less risk the insurance company takes, okay? And the less risk the insurance company takes, right? Because you've given them more and more and more money because ultimately what are they doing, right? They're, they're collecting money from you, right? And they are essentially betting on paying out a benefit to your beneficiaries in the future. Okay. So the longer you live, the more money they're able to collect and the more money they're able to earn essentially. Okay. So the idea is, you know, when you do get to, let's say the, those, those later, those later years, the interest that you're earning is, uh, is, has compounded for multiple years. And that's where people, I think people understand the power of compounding, but nothing out there really compounds, which is interesting. And you know, finance, right? right. But if you go into like the stock market, for instance, that's not compounding and people think it is. And they're told that, you know, the stock market has done, you know, 12% for the last, you know, however many years, but that's not compounding and you can't compound out in the future based on volatility. So I go through a number of examples in the book. You do. You make a really good point. That's like the average return has been 10%. But if, if you have a, a negative cycle, it actually cuts into, uh, it reduces the actual principle. And now the compound is on a reduced principle. So it actually doesn't compound at all. And it's a very good point. So something compounded. And this straight line compounds. That's right. And this, and this does. And so oh, I thought that was just obviously, fascinating. Right? But, you know, four, four to six and you compound that out, it's, it's powerful. But here's the other, here's the other point too. It's, it's an asset that doesn't correlate to the stock market. It doesn't correlate to the real estate market. <clears throat> it's an uncorrelated asset. So what that means is as you've built your wealth with your business or you've built your wealth with real estate, you've built it, you know, with whatever, whatever other venture, it could even be the stock market, right? If you've learned how to trade and so forth. Okay. The idea is that when you get to those later, those later years and you want to have uh, passive income, okay, using this as a part of the income allows you to, you know, essentially model the volatility. So if your real estate is down one year because you had to put money into a roof or you had to, you know, uh, you didn't have a tenant for six months or, you know, wh- whatever the case, when one asset is down, you can leverage this because it didn't correlate to that. And so that allows you consistency with income without having to resort to you know, other measures to get, uh, to, to get money, if that, if that makes sense. So I give some examples in the book of just how to use it if you do have a, a retirement account or a 401k or an IRA, where if you use this, this model, right, of when, a market is, when the market is down uh, and using this, it extends your, your money out triple, triple past what it would have extended out to. And that's why, you know, these days the, the Monte Carlo simulations that have been uh, been used that that interest rate, the income rate that financial planners tell you to use is going from four to three and a half to three, right? And so that what that means is that if you have a million dollars in your, you know, in your retirement account, you know, you, you, they are basically telling you that you can't take more than thirty thousand dollars per year. That's right. And so the, the which is which is just like fascinating to me that people haven't you know connected those dots. But this allows you to take a higher distribution rate from those accounts if you have one of these set up with a certain amount of money uh, in there. And that's, that's explained in the book as well. But it's not one of those things where it's like, this is how you use it in, in retirement, right? It's one of those things where it compounds out a really long time if you have the policy for that long, okay? But it also, when you distribute money, has tax, it's tax-free distribution if you do it right. Uh, and then as far as your other assets are concerned, Okay, you can structure it so that some money is coming from the insurance policy, some money is coming from the other assets, and you can balance, balance it out so that you don't deplete one, one or the other. Does that make sense? 
It does. You know, the thing, the fundamental thing is you don't have to be rich to learn from the rich. And uh, Patrick, your book is Heads I Win, Tails You Lose, A Financial Strategy for Reigniting the American Dream. Everyone listening to this needs to buy this book because it's definitely a game changer. It was for me. So it was really great meeting you and, uh, and, and just reading this book and understanding the strategy a lot more. So I will be working with you to kind of work this out for myself. So Patrick, thank you so much for coming on the show. Michael, it was uh, awesome to be on. Great conversation. Thank you. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Patrick Donahoe. So as homework right now, you have two books you need to read. One is, of course, my book, Financial Freedom with Real Estate Investing. Must read. Followed very closely by Patrick's Heads I Win, Tails You Lose. Um, really fascinating stuff. He has lots of examples in there. And I think uh, it's like this, you know, what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to shift your minds about what you think about apartment building investing. And Patrick's really trying to shift your mind what you think about banking and saving and investing. So it's definitely a mind shifting kind of book and it gives you a lot of the how to as well. So definitely check that out and contact him for more information if you want to get started with that as well. Really excited about my upcoming live event. It's called Dealmaker Live. It's November 2nd through 4th at the at the Hyatt in Reston, Virginia. That's November 2nd through 4th. So put that on your calendar. Go to the michaelblanc.com forward slash events and find out for more information and to sign up. Um, I can say that uh, tickets are selling out fast. We only have about 300 capacity in this room and we will definitely fill up because we're promoting it to uh, DealMaker Mastermind members first before the general public. Now we're in the general public, so it's now open to you guys. It's really all about deals. DealMaker Live, we have a community called DealMaker Mastermind. Once a month we get together and, and we share uh, a share live deal together and we have Q&A and now we're gonna do it in person. So we're going to have people present real live deals, how they found it, how they finance it, how they've raised the money for it. Some twists and turns are going to be Q&A. And as all of my events, there's going to be a ton of networking. There's VIP options available as well. So go to michaelblank.com forward slash events, find out more info and grab your tickets. All right, you guys, really appreciate it. I will catch you on the next episode. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, the next step, download this ebook right here, okay? When you've downloaded that, uh, make sure you also subscribe to my YouTube channel because then you can get all of the videos that I release as soon as I release. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel right now. Click on that right now. And then also make sure that this is the next best video to watch is this one right here. So hope you enjoy that. I'll catch you next time.